Well, thank you, Charles and the team, for leading our time of worship and singing. Wonderful to be able to sing to our awesome God. And uh, we continue our worship now by opening the Word of God and uh, looking at a text in Matthew chapter 5. So I invite you to do that. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Last week, we talked a little bit about the pursuit of happiness. And I mentioned to you that it is the lifelong goal of many people to be happy. And happiness comes in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Somebody has said that men are generally happier than women. (laughs) What do you think? (laughs) A lady once commented, she said, men are generally happier than women. What do you expect from such simple creatures? (laughs) A bit harsh, wasn't it? (laughs) And then she gave a list of reasons why men are happier. She said, well, your last name stays put. Um, The garage is all yours. Wedding plans just take care of themselves. Chocolate is just another snack. Car mechanics tell you the truth. You (laughs) You don't have to stop and think which way to turn the nut on a bolt. (laughs) wrinkles add character, wedding dress, $5,000, suit rental, $100, (laughs) new shoes don't cut or blister or mangle your feet, phone conversations are all over in 30 seconds, a five-day holiday only requires one suitcase, (laughs) and if he forgets to invite you, he or she can still be your friend. I mean, does it sound familiar? I think uh, it's probably uh, true, maybe. Um, That, uh, that maybe men are a little bit more happy in that sense. You can do your Christmas shopping, right, for 20 relatives on December 24th in 20 minutes. So it is good to be a man at times, isn't it? No wonder men are happier, she says. Some clever character offered another light-hearted comment about happiness. He said this, everybody you know can make you happy. Some by arriving and some by leaving. <laughs> well, if you were to complete the sentence... Happiness is, what would you say? How would you complete that sentence? What is the secret to happiness? What is the secret to true happiness and joy and bliss? Well, thankfully, the Bible has a lot to say about this issue, and we're currently studying through the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached nearly 2,000 years ago, and he answers this question for us. This sermon, as I said, known as the Sermon on the Mount, contains what we could say the secret to true happiness. It unfolds the journey that one must take to have a life that is full of joy and gladness and contentment and happiness. And so we want to look at that sermon again this morning. The sermon goes through chapter 5 of Matthew, chapter 6 and chapter 7, but we're just beginning this sermon, looking at it a little bit at a time. And I want to read that first section of the sermon again just to refresh our minds and just to put the verses in the text in front of us. So let me read the first few verses of Matthew chapter 5. Beginning in verse 1 there, it says, Seeing the crowds, he, this is Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now this passage that I've just read to us is sometimes called the Beatitudes. The word Beatitude is a Latin word, simply means blessed or blessed. And as we read through those verses, there are nine blessings And these really are qualities that one must possess if he or she wants to be in God's kingdom. And you might ask the question, what is God's kingdom? And last Sunday I was trying to explain that to you when the alarm went off, and so I'll try and explain it a little bit more again today. When you think about God's kingdom, it's it's really the possession that every 
Christian has. It is the, you could say, the spiritual realm that every Christian lives in. And when you think about this kingdom, the kingdom has a king, and we know that Jesus is the king. We've just sung about that. And it's often called the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And the subjects of this kingdom or the citizens of this kingdom are the true followers of Jesus Christ. And this kingdom has, you could say, two expressions. There's like a present aspect of it, and there's a future aspect of this kingdom. The present realm exists right here and now because Jesus is reigning, and he's reigning from heaven, and he's reigning in our hearts, and we are his followers. So this kingdom is present. Verse 3 of Matthew 5 said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's a present reality. But there's also, we believe, a future kingdom, a future earthly kingdom, and Jesus is going to return to earth in line with what the Davidic covenant talks about in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and Jesus is going to come one day in the future, and he's going to reign on earth, and he will sit on his kingly throne. It's called the throne of David, talks about that in Luke chapter 1 verse 32, and he will reign on earth for a thousand years. We call it the millennial kingdom. It's talked about in the book of Revelation and particularly chapter 20, but it's talked about throughout the Old Testament as well. That time, that millennial kingdom, will be the time, remember, when Isaiah talks about the lion will lay down with the lamb. That will be the conditions that happen during that time. But back to these Beatitudes, there are nine key phrases here that really do describe for us what it means to be a true Christian. What does it mean to be a citizen in this kingdom of God? What does that look like? What is their character? And remember last Sunday, we examined that first beatitude in verse 3, which says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And just to remind you that in our unconverted state, in our unbelieving state, as sinners, we are spiritually bankrupt. We had no spiritual treasures to offer God. We were, as it were, like poor beggars. We were lost. We were helpless. And, And apart from the grace of God, we had absolutely nothing to offer God. But when we, and when we come to the knowledge of that position, of that lowly position of being poor in spirit, it is then, and it is only then, that we can actually enter into the kingdom of, of God or the God's kingdom. When we obtain an accurate perspective, it is then and only then that God's grace will pour into our lives. I appreciated what um, Grace Green posted on our Facebook page on OBC Unite during the week. She posted that little short message that Johnny Erickson Tata um, spoke on. And she was talking about being poor in spirit. And she said it means that we realize how spiritually empty we are and how bankrupt we are. And when we recognize that, we recognize how much we need Jesus. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. And how much we need Jesus. God's grace, because we don't have anything sufficient in ourselves. And you could say, verse 3 of the Beatitudes, you could say, happy are the humble. That's what it means. Blessed are the poor in spirit is the same as saying, happy are the humble. Because when we recognize that we are poor in spirit, it opens the floodgates for God's grace to enter into our lives. So the starting point for getting into God's kingdom, the starting point for being, um, for being happy is to be humble, where we are empty of ourselves, as it were. We understand we have no self-sufficiency whatsoever. Happy are the humble. And I know that sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it, in some ways, but it's not. It's absolutely true. But we want to look at verse 4 today. We want to zero in on that one particularly. And this is the beatitude that says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And once again, our minds might automatically think this is a bit of a contradiction. Blessed are those who mourn. How can that be? Happy, in other words, happy are the sad, is how you could say it. Which doesn't sound right. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? How can one be a joyful mourner? That sounds crazy. We want to look at that this morning. And the first thing we want to ask is, well, what does it mean to mourn in this verse? What is Jesus talking about when he refers to mourning in this beatitude? Now, in the 
in the New Testament, which was written in Greek, there were nine Greek words that describe the concept of mourning or sorrow or sadness. And the word that Jesus used here when he was preaching this sermon just happens to be what you could say the, the strongest word for mourning in the Greek language. It is a word that is used in Scripture sometimes to describe a parent's grief or a father's grief at the tragic death of a son. And if you know what the Septuagint is, that's the Old, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but then it was translated into Greek. The Septuagint uses that word to describe the sadness and the grief that Jacob experienced when he believed that his son Joseph was dead, when it was talking about his mourning. It's also the same word that was used to describe the heartache and the grief that the disciples were experiencing after Jesus had been crucified and before he had resurrected. And so the word that is used here, it's not just talking about a tiny bit of sadness or a snippet of sorrow. This word mourning is talking about deep, heartfelt grief. And having said that, I don't want you to miss the true meaning of this verse and, and to to help you grasp the meaning of what's going on here, let me, let me say to you what it doesn't mean. This is what Jesus doesn't mean by this verse. Think, with, think along with me as I just mention this. I mean, even though I just mentioned a couple of examples of how this word has been used in the, in the Bible, in the context of a human death and its associated grief, understand this, that this verse that Jesus is preaching here, the context of this verse is not talking about physical death. When Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, he doesn't have a funeral in mind. He's not referring to those who are grieving and mourning over the death of a loved one. It just wouldn't make sense in this context. So this verse is not a verse that you would read at a funeral. To do so would be to take it completely out of context. Now, don't get me wrong. There is certainly comfort from God when we lose a loved one and when we face mourning and deep grief. And obviously, the Holy Spirit is our comforter as well. But that's not the context of this verse. Neither is this verse a promise to those who experience some sort of sadness or some kind of disappointment in life. For example, this is not a verse to claim if you are a I gotta be careful what I say here. If you are a sad South African after the All Blacks give the Springboks a hiding. <clears throat> okay, okay, I understand. More realistically, it's the other way around at the moment. I get it. So you can't claim this verse. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Nor is it a verse that you can claim if you're in tears because you've just missed your connecting flight at the airport. Nor is this the verse that you can use when you open up your NCEA results and there is this statement across the top of your paper that says, not achieved. I remember my dad told me one time that his professors, when he was studying at Canterbury University, would often quote this verse to his students just in case some of them failed. <laughs> Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, you know what? It's got nothing to do with that at all. Neither does this verse apply to what we might call um, superficial sorrow or insincere remorse or insincere mourning. You know, there are times, aren't there, when individuals sin and they feel deep remorse and they have a sense of guilt and they have an understanding that they've done something wrong. And yes, they mourn, but it's kind of like a false kind of mourning. It's a little bit like when you think of kids, you know, when they sort of have those crocodile tears. It's just a false kind of mourning. It's phony. It's superficial. It's insincere. It's not genuine. Remember Cain, Cain and Abel. Well, Cain was sad after murdering his brother, but his sadness and his mourning was not over his sin of killing his brother, but over the sentence that God gave him and that he was going to be banished out into the desert. That's why he was sad. That upset Cain, but his sorrow certainly wasn't a godly sorrow. It was superficial. It wasn't true biblical mourning. Same with Judas. Remember him, right? 
After betraying Jesus, he realized that he'd done something wrong. He even threw back those 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests. He even said, I have sinned, but his heart was not in the right place. He was motivated by the fear of man and not the fear of God, and he did not seek true forgiveness. His was a a phony kind of mourning. It was a false sorrow. J.C. Ryle, I like J.C. Ryle. He's written some really good books and some challenging quotes. He said this. He said, It is possible for a man to feel his sins and be sorry for them, to be under strong conviction of guilt and express deep remorse, to be pricked in conscience and exhibit much distress of mind. And yet, he says, for all this, not repent in his heart. Present danger, he says, or the fear of death may account for all his feelings and the Holy Spirit may have done no work whatsoever in his soul. It's a bit to grasp, I understand, but J.C. Ryle's right. It's a scary thought, but it's a reality. Many a man or woman has been, have been deeply sorry for their sinful actions, but not because of the sin, but because they got caught. So the mourning that Jesus is describing here in this verse is not what we experience at the death of a loved one, nor is it the sadness that's brought on by disappointment, nor is it a sorrow that comes from being caught doing something wrong. The mourning that Jesus is speaking about here in this verse is, we could say, a spiritual mourning. It's a godly sorrow. It's what Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 that leads to genuine repentance and salvation. Paul said in that verse, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. See, that worldly grief, worldly mourning, Paul says, produces death. And so let me remind you that all of these Beatitudes that we're looking at, they have a reference to a spiritual condition or a spiritual attitude. Remember that one in verse 3, to be poor in spirit was not poor materially or poor financially, it was poor in a spiritual sense. And so Jesus, remember, in the sermon is, is addressing our hearts, our inner being. And even the sequence of these Beatitudes is important The first one that we looked at to be poor in spirit is to recognize, as I said, our complete bankruptcy and our unconverted state. We have nothing to give to God. We're cruising on empty, as it were. The addition of all our righteous efforts, as James reminded us, is like filthy rags, and it's going to add nothing to us. We still have, we we have zilch to offer God. But it's one thing to come to the conclusion that we are spiritually bankrupt, and then the question is, then what? We understand we're poor in spirit, then what? Well, some people might just sit back and do nothing. They might embrace their spiritual bankruptcy and do nothing about it. Well, that's not good either. It's not enough to acknowledge you're spiritually bankrupt with a cold heart. Once you've understood that you are spiritually bankrupt, it should lead you to the second beatitude of spiritual mourning. In other words, you are spiritually bankrupt because of your sinfulness, and that reality should bring you to the point where you will mourn over your sin. To be poor in spirit is to be humbly convicted of your sin, whereas to mourn is to be contrite for it. Thomas Watson said, sin must have tears, and I understand what he means by that. Those who enter into God's kingdom understand fully that they have been humbled, that they are wounded and broken under the crushing burden of their sin. Let me say this. If, if you are kind of ho-hum about your sin, about sin in your life, if you're blasé about sin, or you couldn't really care less, or even if you love sin, I mean, I can say with biblical conviction that you're not likely in God's kingdom. You cannot enter God's kingdom until there is like a genuine mourning for sin in your life. Because God's kingdom is populated with people who have broken and contrite hearts. 
who mourn over the stench and the ugliness of their sin. Let me say it this way. A true Christian will have a personal hatred of their sin and it will cause them to mourn over it. The difficulty with a lot of Christians today is that they don't really mourn over their sin because maybe they have a secret love affair with their sin. They're constantly maybe telling white lies and they don't care about it. They're forever lusting after worldly things and they don't care. They're full of gossip and greed and maybe gluttony or some sin like that. They disobey God and they have no conscience about it at all. They like their sin. They enjoy it. So they play with it and they use it to entertain their lives. But here's the irony of this beatitude. If you want to be truly happy, if you want to be truly blessed, you must hate your sin. You must. To put it simply, your sin should bring tears to your eyes. I've said it a few times in recent years, and I, well, I suspect that we, and when I say we, I mean the church in general around the world, we don't have a, a wide enough and a deep enough appreciation of the sinfulness of sin. The doctrine of sin, you could say, is, has, has in some ways been watered down over the years. It doesn't seem to hold the same weight that it used to hold. And you might ask the question, well, why is that? Well, Maybe a number of reasons. I mean, you look around our world, right? Sin is everywhere. It's so rampant in society that in some ways it doesn't shock us anymore that we just become so used to it and we get so accustomed to it in our world and that attitude filters down into our own lives. Let me give you like a quick lesson on the doctrine of sin. Let's call it the depravity of man. That's what it is, the sinfulness of man. Or better still, let's call it the total depravity of man and his utter inability to please God. When you look at the Bible, when you open up the Scriptures, we can see clearly that the Bible tells us that as fallen men, we are totally depraved. We are in bondage to sin. The Bible describes it as being a slave to sin. And it all began back in the Garden of Eden. You all know Genesis chapter 3 very well, the fall of man. And from that point on, the, the devastation of sin is everywhere in the world, and it's everywhere written throughout the Bible. We see it way back even before the flood. Remember that? In Genesis 6 verse 5, there's a verse there where it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's why God sent the flood, because the sin of humanity was so bad. But do you know what? The flood didn't make any difference to the heart of man. It didn't make any difference to the sinfulness of sin. After the flood, you read about the same story in in Genesis 8, just after the flood, verse 21, it says, And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. And then he says, For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. The heart of mankind is wicked. The natural bent is to sin. Ultimately, man has no ability to do anything that is spiritually good or right in his own strength. Jeremiah the prophet reminds us in Jeremiah 17 verse 9 that the heart is desperate, is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? It's hard to understand it. It's full of sin. David tells us in Psalm 51, Gary read it this morning, that that he inherited a sinful nature before he was even born. Psalm 51 verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, And in sin did my mother conceive me. That's David's description of his own sinful heart from the very beginning of his life, from the very from the point of conception. He's not talking there about his mother being unfaithful at all, as some people think. You go to the New Testament, pick up the book of Romans, you read through Romans chapter one, and it provides you a whole list of sins that are true of humanity. You go over to Romans chapter three, um, have, have a look at that one. Let me read you some of those verses. I mean, you ask the question, what influence does sin have in the life of us today? It says there in, verse, uh, in chapter three, verse 10, as it is written, none is righteous. This is the effect of sin. None is righteous. No, not one. There is not one righteous person on this planet. 
No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is ugly stuff. This is what sin does to mankind. This is the effect of sin. It's bad news, isn't it? We aren't born good or semi-good or morally neutral. We're born sinners, totally depraved, every single one of us. And by the way, we need the bad news first. And this is bad news. Because to be honest, until you understand the bad news, the good news is not good. (laughs) And grace is not yet grace. We understand, don't we, that apart from God's grace, we're ruined, we're shattered, we're destroyed. Apart from God's grace, we're God's enemies. We're haters of God. We shake our fists in God's face. The book of Ephesians paints the same ghastly picture. It describes humanity as being dead in sin and children of wrath. Go and read Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 2. It's not saying there that we're sick or a little bit sickly or doing okay, but we're dead in sin. Sin has caused a death blow to our spirit. We're separated from Christ. We're alienated from God. We're spiritually dead because sin has had a radical impact on our hearts and our lives and our affections and our attitudes and even in our decision making. And because of the depth and because of the impact of sin in our fallen state, We were actively pursuing rebellion, suppressing the truth, pleasing self, hostile to God, and disobeying God. I hope you're getting the idea of how bad sin is. (laughs) And there's no wiggle room when you get to Romans chapter 8 and you read verses 6, 7, and 8 there. This is what Paul says. He says, "For, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. This is what an unbeliever does, set the mind on the flesh, but to set The mind on the spirit is life and peace. It's talking about a believer. And then verse 7, for the the mind that is set on the flesh, this is talking about an unbeliever, is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Listen to it, listen to this. It indeed it cannot. It cannot. Those who are in the flesh, listen to this, cannot please God. Unbelievers cannot please God ever. It states emphatically here that as a result of our sin nature, we are not able to obey God. We cannot please God. Sin has completely cut us up from God. That's why we need grace. It's grace, God's grace, that opens our eyes, that changes our heart, and it's an undeserved gift from God. We sing that song sometimes. It's an old hymn. Grace, grace, God's grace is greater than what? It's our sin. God's grace is greater than our sin. We say amen to that. But you might be thinking to yourself, hang on, Phil. Hang on. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian now, so the power of sin has been broken in my life. I'm no longer a slave to sin. The penalty penalty of sin has been paid by Christ. And if you say that, I say to you, amen, praise the Lord. That is 100% true. But... But you are not yet free from the presence of sin as a believer. In this world, don't be fooled because sin can still get a hold of you. And in that sense, as Christians, we need to treat it, I guess you could say, with utmost respect. We can't minimize sin. We can't ignore it. We can't sweep it under the carpet. In fact, we must grow a hatred for sin. And as this verse says, And Matthew 5 reminds us we should be mourning over our sin. Let me give you another reason, another reason why we should hate sin and mourn over it. Because it was sin that killed Jesus. Sin put Jesus on the cross. Christ died for our sin. We know that, don't we? He suffered the anguish and the agony of a Roman crucifixion, but he also at the same time endured the wrath of God upon himself because of our sin, our sin. And so how hypocritical that any of us should treat sin so flippantly. 
in our lives. Let us not be entertained and amused by those sinful things by which Christ died. I wonder then, perhaps the problem is that we don't think deeply enough about the sinfulness of sin. As I said, we're too flippant sometimes and a bit ho-hum about it. You know, sadly, it is easy to minimize sin because, as I said, we see it everywhere all around us. And what happens is we minimize God's glory and we minimize God's holiness and we minimize his justice. And in doing so, we minimize his grace. But we must recognize that sin still has a horrible impact in the life of a believer. And so we need to brace ourselves, as it were, to deal with it. Yes, as I said, the power of sin has been broken. The penalty penalty of sin is gone and dealt with. But the presence of sin is still with us until the day we die or until Christ comes again. But think about, as Christians, how should we still be responding? You know the Apostle Paul, we all know him, we're familiar with him. He was a powerful, passionate, mature Christian. And yet, how did he describe his life in relation to sin? Paul said this, as a believer, he said, wretched man that I am. Paul knew full well that he was in a battle between the flesh and and the spirit, and oftentimes sin would get a hold of Paul. And it would make him ineffective for the Lord. And there were times when he desired to do what was good, and he desired to do what was right, but he struggled to do it because sin had overcome him. You can read about that in Romans 7. And then in another place, Paul said in 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, he said, I am, the apostle Paul, this great Christian man, he says, I am the chief of what? Sinners. <laughs> this is like a godly man admitting it. He kept his depravity at the forefront of his mind. He mourned over his sin, I guarantee it. Why? Why did he do that? Because it helped him to grasp the fullness of God's grace. I mean, we need to think like that. We must be weary certainly of sin and its influence, we must hate it. I mean, church history is packed full of godly saints who experience God's blessing because they had an accurate view of their own sin and their own wickedness. You could look at the life of a guy by the name of John Bradford. He was an English reformer, a preacher. He was burned at the stake in 1555, and it is said that he hardly went a day in which he did not weep over his sin. David Brainard, another name you may be familiar with, he was a, a minister and a missionary. He had a deep sense of his own sin. sin. He wrote this in his diary. He said, I was convinced of my great vileness and corruption. He writes this as a believer. And of my utter inability to do anything spiritually good and that I was a burden to myself and to all around me. And that I should never be blessed until I was wholly and entirely given up to God. When did you last make an entrant, you know, something in your diary like that, or thought about that? Martin Luther said, "Mourning for sin is a rare herb, and it it is to be found only in the garden of the cross." Or to put it in 21st century language, he basically would say, "Sorrow for sin is an endangered species, but it shouldn't be." Because it's the only way to true freedom and happiness, according to Jesus. So even today as Christians, we must have a healthy appreciation of the impact of sin in our lives. There ought to be a sense of remorse and a a sense of mourning. And so we need to ask ourselves the question this morning, is there a sorrow for sin in my heart, my own sin? If you want to know God's true blessing and experience joy Pray that God would give you a hatred for sin. That will lead to a broken heart that hates sin, and that leads to God's blessing. And as I said, I wonder if the 21st century church has forgotten some of these truths. You remember what Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5? Woe is me, he said, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. Isaiah understood his situation in his day. And if a prophet of God thought like this, how much more should we be thinking like that? 
The same was true of Job. You read about his life, right? He went through a bunch of incredible tough battles, and after wrestling with God for a while, he came to an accurate understanding of his own position where he says, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. I think we need a deeper, fuller comprehension of the doctrine of sin. And not only that, we need a firmer grasp of God's holiness and God's grace. But when we think about God's holiness, it drives us to understand more about our own sinfulness. I think of the Apostle Peter as well. Remember what he did that time? He was out fishing all night, didn't catch anything. He comes into the shore and he sees Jesus there. And Jesus says, hey, why don't you throw the net on the other side of the boat? And you know what happened, right? This massive haul of fish came in. The net was so full that it was starting to break. And as Peter saw that, he was unbelievably uh, amazed by that and blown away by the miraculous power of God before his very eyes, and he became instantly aware of being in the presence of Jesus Christ, who is himself God, and Peter said to Jesus, depart from me, what? I am a sinful man. These, listen to this, these followers of God are not having a self-pity party. To think like this is not morbid Christianity, far from it. This is the characteristic of true Christianity, genuine Christianity. To constantly mourn over your sin does not drive you to the depths of despair, in in a sense, nor does it lead you into dark depression. True biblical mourning for sin is not a position of hopelessness or a position of weakness. When we truly mourn over the, the wickedness of our sin, it really is a position of strength because that's when God promises blessing because the verse says, blessed are those who mourn. A true understanding of your sin is the pathway to blessedness and joy and contentment and internal happiness that cannot be produced by anything else. In case you're still maybe shaking your head a little bit, understanding our sin correctly does something else. Something amazing. You know what? God uses it to lead us to Christ. It points us to the Redeemer, Psalm 34 says that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. King David, you know him, don't you? He committed some of the most horrific sins a man could commit. He committed adultery. He plotted the murder of a man. He lied. He deceived people. He was unrepentant probably for up to a year. You know what happened, right? He came to his senses. Nathan came along, tapped him on the shoulder, pointed out his sin. David recognized the gravity of his sin, that he had offended lots of people, but most of all, he had offended God, and he was overcome with emotion, and his remorse was genuine, it was real, and it led to true repentance, and that's why David could write Psalm 51 that we heard this morning, and at the end of that psalm, David said this, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. The question is, are are we like that? Like David, are we broken and contrite over the sin that still plagues our lives? There's another wonderful truth in this verse, and that is, and I'll just touch on it briefly, those who mourn biblically are not only blessed, but they are comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What does it mean to be comforted? Well, These are those who have recognized their sinful hearts and they're mourning over their sin. They receive the comfort of God. What does that look like? Well, we know, don't we, that God is the father of um, comfort. He's the God of mercies. He's the God of all comfort. We're obviously comforted by the Holy Spirit who lives within us. He is the divine comforter who brings peace and joy and comfort and happiness. Naturally, the word of God comforts us as we read through that. Psalm 19 reminds us that the word of God revives our soul. It rejoices our heart. But ultimately, the comfort is found in Jesus Christ alone, who can heal our broken hearts, who can forgive us, who can extend his grace to us, who can give us hope. And we know Jesus reaches out to those who are weak and weary and heavy laden, and he wants us to come to him. And that comfort does arrive when true repentance takes place after we've sinned and we experience God's forgiveness. 
ultimately that comfort comes when we know God has forgiven our sins. And you know what? The Bible says if we confess our sins, God will forgive us. And he'll cast our sins, as it were, like a billion miles away, as far as the east is from the west, as, as far down as the depths of the d- deepest ocean. God throws our sins away, and we're comforted by God's forgiveness. And God's forgiveness really is a theme, a great theme. It's a whole other sermon, really. But this is just a little snippet of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. If you want to know if you're in God's kingdom, there will be a genuine and a regular sorrow and mourning over your sin, which will naturally lead to repentance and confession, and God will comfort you. Maybe you've never evaluated your life like this, as I've been explaining this morning. Well, you could and you should do it. We need to understand the depth of our sin before we can ever enjoy the grace and the goodness and even the salvation of God. Before God in our fallen state, we are sinners, we're fallen creatures, we're slaves to sin, we're spiritually dead, incapable of pleasing God, as I said. But you can move from a position of sinfulness to a place of forgiveness and a place in God's kingdom. And the Bible says to do that, you have to understand and admit your sin and confess your sin and repent of your sin and ask God to forgive you and beg for his grace. And God will forgive you and he'll send his grace and he'll give you a salvation that is free, a free gift. And he'll give you the faith even to believe and to believe who Jesus is and why he came and that he died for our sin and he rose again and that he rose victoriously. May the Lord open all of our eyes to these wonderful truths. And when he opens our eyes, he regenerates our hearts, our affections are renewed, we begin to love Christ more and we begin to hate sin more and more. A question that Jesus asks at the very end of the sermon is, do you want to be a wise person Or do you want to be a foolish person? And I think, if we're honest, we all want to be wise, right? Well, Jesus says, if you want to be the wise person, you need to listen to these words that he's spoken and not just hear them, but apply them, obey them in your own life. And if you do that, you will be a wise person. If you want God's blessing, the verse says, blessed are those who mourn over their sin, for they will be comforted. Let's just bow our heads and finish our time in prayer. I think we are going to finish with a song. There's a song I think that'll be good for us to finish with. But maybe even as our heads are bowed, maybe there's some issues even in your own heart and your own life that you need to deal with today with the Lord. He is forgiving. God hears our prayers if they're prayers of confession and repentance. So if there's something in your life that you know you need to confess and repent, now's a good time to do it. God will hear it and he'll forgive you. Father, we are thankful for your grace and your mercy. We've sung about those wonderful truths today. Lord, we're thankful that we can, as it were, come to the altar as we sang too, and you're there waiting for us with open arms to be able to receive us and forgive us. Lord, we can't bring anything of our own merit to you, but we can just beg for your mercy and Lord, we're so thankful that we can get a righteousness, not of our own, but it's the righteousness of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, if anybody's here today that hasn't yet turned from their sin and repented of it and followed Christ, I pray that you would work in their hearts and their minds to be able to make that decision, that you would open their eyes and regenerate their hearts so that they can become part of your kingdom, that they would be citizens of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so, Father... I I pray that you take these truths and that you would burn them deeply into our hearts for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.